begin, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to have you here in our fourth week in a row of webinars with our own experts from the Hebrew University. Today we have the great pleasure to host Professor Aaron Troen from the Hebrew University's Faculty of Agriculture, Food and Environment. Professor Troen's research focuses on nutritional neuroscience. Professor Troen was a member of the National Con Council of Food Security Research Committee and is currently working in collaboration with Leket Israel to investigate the role of food banks in alleviating food insecurity and its deleterious consequences for human development, health, and well being. His, uh, his webinar today will focus on nutrition, food security, and the coronavirus. After his lecture, you're welcome to ask questions by raising your digital hand. This is our last webinar before the Passover break, but we are already working for the next series that will begin on April 22. So I hope to meet you again after Pesach. So thank you to all for participating. Chag Pesach Sameach to all. And Professor Troen, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll uh, share my screen in a moment and move on to the presentation. I was delighted a few days ago when I was asked to um, join in in the efforts that the Hebrew University is making to communicate with our community and friends uh, uh, around the world, um, reflecting on how this uh, pandemic is affecting us in all sorts of dimensions, beginning with the research that's being done at the Hebrew U to find a cure for the disease um, and uh, more uh, disseminated widespread uh, effects that the condition is having on the human uh, affairs um, such as uh, food security. Um, as uh, Mara said, I direct a lab that focuses primarily on nutrition and brain health. And much of my research is in the laboratory um, trying to find a cure for the effects of aging on the brain, um, really to slow dementia and cerebral vascular disease and stroke. Um, so I'm not an expert on um, COVID virus or an infectious disease, um, but I will share with you uh, some reflections rather than a formal academic lecture um, that has to do with what we're all doing these days, which is to use our own skills um, and uh, insight um, and the tools that we have at our with, uh, with, uh, with the tools we have at our disposal to try to deal with the problems that we can have some benefit for. And I'll share with you what uh, some of my students have done recently um, in looking at the literature and putting together a proposal that may have some benefit um, and may be some good news for us. Um, so just to begin, uh, we're situated, let me share the screen. Um, Professor Troen? Yes? Professor Troen, can you, hear, can you raise your, your volume a bit? Um, certainly, I'll try. Okie dokie, I'll try to move that closer to me, just a moment, please. We're all yeah, learning I... to uh, work from our home studios. It's quite an adjustment. So Thank just you. a moment. Do you hear me well now? I, yeah, I have I a microphone, yes. so <laughs> I'll try to speak into the microphone. Um, let me, do you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, so, first of all, um, I just wanted to introduce where that, that background, the virtual background that I put behind uh, me in my um, office, um, is the view that I have from my office at the Faculty of Agriculture, Food and Environment, um, where we uh, have the Institute of Biochemistry, Food Science and Nutrition, and the School of Nutritional Sciences uh, that trains uh, uh, one of the premier institutions in training uh, Israeli uh, registered dietitians. Uh, we have about 400 bachelor's students a year, um, uh, or every year we have uh, 50 master's students and roughly 20 PhD students all engaged in a study of nutrition science and how it affects our health um, as one of the components in the food chain, the supply from the farm to the fork, trying to figure out how to feed the world effectively. Um, but uh, as such, um, here's a little cartoon. In times of emergency, we try to say, okay, let's get a panel of experts together and uh, you can break the glass in case uh, of an emergency. 
Um, and as I pointed out, my expertise is really focused on uh, brain function and the effect of nutrition on the brain. Um, that isn't of use today, so we'll move on and tell you what usually happens when I say that I'm a professor at the School of Nutrition. People say, oh, well, what should I eat? Um, what's good for my brain? What's good for my diet? Um, and oftentimes uh, the motivation that we have, uh, the first motivation that we have is figuring out how a given situation affects ourselves. Now, I'm sure that you've uh, opened the newspaper and seen columns that say, how should we manage our stress under these conditions that we're living in? The uncertainty, the social distancing, being closed off in our homes from one another. Um, and uh, I certainly know that I spend uh, a great deal more time in front of the refrigerator than I normally would. Um, we don't want to wind up uh, like uh, Thor here um, from uh, the Marvel Avengers series uh, when he wound up at the end of the uh, Infinity Wars uh, putting on a great deal of weight. Um, there are a whole variety of experts that are, are better experts than me that can say, you know, what should we do? And the focus of dietitians is typically to say, nutrition science tells us that we want to make sure to have a balanced diet, to eat real food, and not focus on any particular um, magic uh, remedy or magic diet that's going to cure the disease, prevent us from getting ill, or uh, in this course of uh, uh, our routine day to day, um, prevent us from getting fat, and make us youthful and beautiful and, and feeling well. Um, so I just copied just as an example, the COVID page from the American Society of Nutrition, one of the leading nutrition societies in the world, and they give some help uh, and advice for a pandemic. You may want to minimize trips to the supermarket during the pandemic and eat healthy. Um, so before you shop for the coronavirus, you want to plan ahead. You want to think, think nutrition. And what does that mean? Well, have a largely a plant-based diet, eat lots of uh, fruits and vegetables, minimize your fat and sugar intake, and all the general dietary advice that you know for day to day uh, would be true for a pandemic. It's particularly true because what you want to do is make sure that you don't um, wind up with dietary problems with overeating because you stand at the refrigerator all day. You make a shopping list. You stock up a nutrition-packed foods that will stay fresh for a week or longer. And interestingly, they say here to limit purchase of tempting foods. Really, we all know that it's very hard, hard to diet. It's very hard to change our habits. It's even harder to change our habits when we're under stress. Now, it's important to be aware of it. It's important to communicate that both in professional societies um, or uh, through the newspapers, but that's really not um, going to have a major effect. The environment that we live in does have a major effect, so that if you don't buy potato chips and stock your pantry with them, then the chances that you're going to be eating potato chips all day is reduced and your diet may improve as a result. Um, the psychology of diet, nutrition, and the nudges that we can program into our day-to-day -day are all very useful. Um, on an individual basis. And my talk today will focus not on the individual basis, but rather on the collective basis, which I think is um, more important when you look at this from a population perspective. Um, what I really liked about the uh, advice from the American Society of Nutrition is that it focused on other things, like think about your friends and neighbors, especially older adults, those with health conditions. Can you save them a trip to this grocery store? Can you help them? The second uh, advice I gave was uh, really touched on food safety. There are often questions that people have. Um, can I contract COVID by eating food that has been contaminated by someone else who handled the package or sneezed on it at the supermarket? Um, so the advice is keep your hands clean, practice good hygiene, wear gloves, use a disinfecting wipe on any handle or surface that you touch like the shopping carts. Um, they talk about preparing for the unexpected, the fact that supermarkets are running low on many items. I know in Israel, it's very, very hard to find eggs. And there was a run on eggs, um, not because Israel doesn't produce enough eggs. We do. The chickens produce lay one egg a day. Um, so you have the same amount of eggs every day of the year. 
Um, but they disappeared all of a sudden because people were hoarding them, stocking up, eating more than the usual, saving more than the usual food supply could bear. Um, so there are all sorts of downstream effects and unanticipated effects that happen to the food supply and the food chain. And again, the American side of nutrition, and I would agree with this entirely, say keep the less unfortunate in mind. And they talk about contributing to local food pantries and soup kitchens. So food safety is a concern um, that we all share. Um, the second point of advice was to eat out safely. Now this was posted on March 18th and now that people aren't even allowed to the houses and restaurants are closed, then it goes back to this issue of how we maintain food safety. And the third element was simply thinking positive, maintaining a positive mindset. Um, one could add to that, of course, exercise, which is often physical activity is often very important for maintaining our uh, mental well-being. Um, I know it's very hard to sit in a chair like I, I wind up doing uh, day in and day night, particularly when we're constrained to home. Um, so that's common sense advice. Now for this, my grandmother would say, well, I knew all of that. For this, you got a PhD. It's not so obvious. I just want to touch on food safety Mr. and corona Sorry. disease. Yes. Sorry to bother you again. Um, can mm -hmm. you expand your, your uh, slides? so that people can see them better? Do I see them full screen on my computer? How do you mean expand the slides? No, we don't see them full screen. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can change the screen sharing for a moment. Let me try to reshare this and see what happens. Oh, I see. Forgive me for the technical. Image. Thank you, Mara. Do you see it full screen now? Yeah, now it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, I apologize for the technical snafu. Um, I've been asked about food safety in a variety of public health panels that I'm involved in and um, without any particular expertise. I've also asked my colleagues in the Institute who deal with food safety specifically. And the general consensus is that there is no evidence that the coronavirus is spread through food. Um, it is mainly a respiratory disease and the infection is by the virus entering into the airways. Um, so gaining it through the food uh, gastrointestinal tract is uh, um, thought to be unlikely. Uh, having said that, it's the contact, people touching something that's infected and then touching their faces, which may carry risk. And so if you're handling food that has been somehow contaminated and you then bring that up towards your face, your eyes and your nose, there is a chance of, um, of infection. Now, mind you, no one has done a clinical trial to prove this. And so this is the best guess and you want to practice hygiene and, and be generally uh, uh, food conscious. So you wash your food, wash down the packaging and so on. Um, if you go and Google um, FDA food safety coronavirus, you'll come up with a page that has a whole list of instructions and advice. And generally the safety and health authorities in every country will have one of these types of pages up. But, this really reflects a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And there are questions, lots of questions that go beyond our individual personal well being and the food that we um, consume. So, the questions relating to food and nutrition um, that uh, have to do with food and nutrition during any pandemic, and specifically in this case, don't only deal with the individual diet, but with the population diet. How does this affect? the food that we have available? How does it affect how we consume food? How does it affect our ability to expend energy, use physical activity if we're bound to the house? And how long are we going to be confined to our houses? How will this affect our health? And you should know that the, um, in Israel, where we are um, restricted to 100 meters from our house, we have to go out with masks, no more than two of a household at a time. Uh, there have been very uh, severe restrictions placed um, in the public health association of public health physicians uh, uh, discussion group um, there's been very lively discussion asking well is this really sound um, why not let people go out and exercise in parks or um, 
where they can walk in isolation rather than 100 meters around their houses in urban areas where they actually may be closer together. And the real concern is, once again, can we maintain physical activity? Um, I don't have any personal um, solutions for that. The policy directive has been we need to make very clear guidelines because you can't let people decide for themselves where they go, when they go, and how they go um, into, into the public uh, sphere um, because you'll get chaos. And so from a perspective of limiting and containing the spread of infection, the decision has been made, hold people down, um, and let's do this intensely for the short term in order to break the spread of the disease, in order to flatten the curve, and then slowly, gradually, we'll be able to get out of that uh, without uh, a continuing ongoing chain of infection. But it's the focus on the population here that really matters. And when you think of the focus on population in terms of diet and nutrition, you have to think what that means, what the isolation means for people who have special dietary needs, um, people who are diabetic, people who are homebound, homebound elders who rely on aid and assistance to bring them their food. Um, what happens when you have to deal with clinical nutrition management? Uh, one of my colleagues, for example, Tali Sinai, has helped uh, lead a team to describe the nutritional interventions that are needed to support patients who are intubating. Patients who are on a ventilator and have a tube going down their throat um, can't eat. And if that goes on for a long period of time, for several days at the minimum, then how are they going to be nourished? And so there need to be very special protocols just in the clinical emergency setting, looking at how we deal with this uh, pandemic. Um, and we're very proud of Tali for uh, putting together that work. Um, and that's been uh, coordinated with uh, other colleagues across Europe uh, through the uh, European Society for Clinical Nutrition. There are other kinds of questions which I'm sure you've all seen uh, in your own neighborhoods. What happens to food availability access? What happens to the supply chain? Are we really going to be able to get enough food to the supermarket? Maybe we're producing the food in agriculture on the farms, but we can't get it because people are getting sick, because transportation has been limited, um, because the workers aren't getting to the um, uh, stores to be able to load and unload the trucks and put it on the shelves. And we can't come to the stores freely to purchase what we need. So there's a whole series of ramifications that aren't directly related to food itself, but which have impact on the supply chain. Um, the overall consensus through the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is that at present, there isn't uh, a problem, but there is very clearly anticipation of uh, uh, and concern that there will be ripple effects, for example, on rising prices of food uh, in the long term, which will then affect food security as well. Um, I can tell you that in Israel, um, even though farms are producing uh, uh, food, there's an issue with workers picking the food. There's a challenge to some of the farms which tend to have as their clients or customers um, institutions uh, such as uh, uh, hotels that need food for meals, high quality food. Well, they're not uh, operating anymore. There aren't the uh, uh, clients in hotels. So all of a sudden the customers have gone away or industry, industrial production, which has changed. Um, and then there are the farms which sell to the local markets, the um, uh, uh, open air food markets. And that's about 30% of the produce, um, which all of a sudden, again, has no demand because the markets are closed. Um, so food surplus on the one hand is filed up, but you can't necessarily sell it to market. So food can go to waste in the fields. And the food banks, which rely on this food um, as a donation, uh, don't have the ability uh, necessarily to gather it and then distribute it because the volunteers who would do that normally are confined to their homes. Obviously, this is also manifest in, in major effects on trade and commerce, including the trade and commerce surrounding the food industry. Um, and the food industry itself has to deal with um, workers falling ill. What do you do to a factory when um, some of your workers have become infected and you have uh, uh, food lines which have been produced. Um, the restaurant industry is shut down. So people have lost their livelihood. And um, one can ask questions about food technology. For example, a colleague of mine, Ido Vroslavsky, is working 
uh, with Oded Sashaev uh, at our faculty on 3D printing of artificial meat hamburgers. Now it's really cool high tech stuff and usually we think about this in terms of uh, uh, alternate food sources, um, uh, ethics, sustainability of the environment, reducing the use of animal protein. Um, but now they were able to cast that question in terms of uh, technology that might be developed to allow people to print or produce their food in the home, um, somehow cutting down on the supply chain or, or changing the supply chain dramatically and providing a measure of food safety because you don't have to go through multiple hands who might be infected. Um, obviously, there are microbiological uh, issues having to do with food safety that I won't touch on, but um, one needs to answer those questions. And I've already alluded to the fact that the food may not be available for the food pantry. So what happens to our emergency food services? What happens to school lunch programs when these kids are, are shut out of schools because the schools are shut down? All of a sudden you have people who have been relying on this supplemental food assistance in order to ensure their healthy diet and to relieve some of the burden from the home where the families don't have the means to provide enough food. That expenditure now is um, uh, uh, not utilized and the children are sitting at home without their lunches. So the parents have to provide for that. And that breaks down, how do you deal with that system? And I can tell you that one of the approaches in Israel has been for the government to reallocate the money on an emergency basis from the school lunch program um, to get the companies, the catering services that were producing uh, little hot meal, deliverable meals, and take those meals and distribute them to the elderly who are homebound. Um, I'm dying to have the data to understand how this is being done. Are the resources being used effectively? Is this really being managed properly? And are we achieving the aim of equitably reaching those populations who are vulnerable and at need? Could we be doing this better? Do we need to think about the stress that's placed on the system by the pandemic and understand what it tells us about our routine food security policies? Um, so we really need to understand how communities are rallying around to deal with these issues. And we understand, we need to understand how the government and legislation are dealing with this from a whole variety of perspectives, nutritional, health, economic, social, ethical, and so on, so that we can derive the best policies. Now, this whole slide is a breaking question slide because we don't have the answers. A month and a half ago, I was getting ready for my second semester. And uh, none of us imagined that we'd be sitting at home teaching online, um, much less addressing an international audience such as yourselves. In fact, in the first semester, the course that I teach is nutritional epidemiology. And here's an ironic slide. I showed this uh, historical change in the causes of death. In the early 1900s, most of the diseases leading to death, most of the uh, causes of death were um, uh, largely uh, um, infectious disease, gastrointestinal infections, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and influenza. The rates of disease were, um, all in, of infectious disease were, were up to uh, about half of all cases of death and, and nearly 500 uh, uh, cases of deaths per 100,000 population. Um, nowadays, those infectious disease up till 2010 were maybe um, 44.6 per 100,000 population. Um, pneumonia and influenza, 16.2 uh, per thousand population. So very minor. And what I told my class, these are students who are planning to become registered dietitians and nutritionists, nutrition scientists, I said, really, you know, the, the history of epidemiology begins in infectious disease with the cholera pandemics and understanding how to control them. Um, but now we're really concerned with metabolic disease, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia. Um, and how ironic that uh, by the time the course ended, uh, we're, we're stuck in the middle of an infectious disease outbreak. This is what uh, we traditionally think of as an epidemic among nutritionists. These slides show you the change in the rates of obesity um, from 1990 in the United States to 2010. And these trends are shared uh, all across the world. 
where now nearly a third of the population is overweight or obese. This obviously has tremendous effects in terms of cardiovascular um, morbidity and mortality. And in fact, this is a slide which I used to use for my teaching showing uh, uh, during the Ebola outbreak where um, a few thousand people died and there was concern over this deadly disease uh, that it would somehow spread around the world. Um, and in fact, Ebola is not a good candidate for the kind of pandemic spread that we've seen because even though it can attack humans, the symptoms are um, uh, very recognizable and it causes most of the ca people who are infected to die. So it's terrifying in that sense, it's deadly, but it doesn't spread very well because it kills itself off, kills the carriers off before they can interact in the community. Um, if you look at the numbers of obesity in the United States, they assume there are nearly 300,000 deaths per year from tobacco, from smoking, 450 premature deaths per year, and from alcohol, 88,000 deaths per year. So the non-communicable diseases are really quite important. Now, this is not to say, this is not to say that the pandemic isn't a fundamentally different situation. We don't really know how to deal with it. We don't have enough information. We don't know how this will develop. But you can see that with mortality rates, even if they're only 10 times more than those of the influenza, we're talking about millions of people who could die a year. And unlike Ebola, the symptoms are not, uh, people are, are contagious before the symptoms manifest. And so it spreads very readily. Um, and that's, that's really been a, a huge problem. Having said that, I'd still like to point out that if you look at our healthy behaviors and our ability to modify and prevent the diseases, non-communicable diseases that relate to our, our health behaviors, um, if you just changed fruit and vegetable intake, physical activity, no smoking, alcohol intake, um, and you give a score to this and you look at observational studies in populations, you can find that people who have healthier behavior survive far um, better than people who have uh, avoid these healthy behaviors. And this is why even in the face of a pandemic, if you ask the nutrition societies, the first thing they'll say is, well, don't worry about supplements, don't worry about all those other things. Really what's most important from a dietary perspective is maintain a healthy lifestyle. And that's true because the immune effect, immune um, uh, system also requires adequate healthful nutrition in order to operate at its optimal level and fight off the disease. So you'll both be less likely to um, have severe disease and more capable of, of fighting it off if one's nutritional status is better. Um, the problem is that this slide really reflects the fact that across the population, not everyone has adequate nutritional status. And I'll come back to that when I talk about food security in a moment. But these are observational data and the convention is that what we really want to do is have clinical trials. If I give you a, a Mediterranean diet and I prescribe it and you comply with it and you make sure to eat only healthy and you push aside all those cakes and guilty pleasures and you make sure to exercise 150 minutes a week um, at least, then will you live forever? Well, obviously we won't, um, but we'll have better likelihood of, of living a long, healthy and uh, uh, good life. Having said that, when you look at nutritional epidemiology, you all know that in the media, every day there's a new diet, there's a new fad, there's a new ingredient. New research shows that something will improve your health and prevent uh, you from getting dementia, cancer, or heart disease. And there's a real challenge within the field in saying all these observations are nice, but they could be confounded by a million and one factors. People who have healthier diets tend to be better educated and have higher incomes. And higher incomes predict better health, better access to health care, um, better ability to take care of oneself. Um, and so socioeconomics and nutrition go hand in hand. Um, poor health behaviors like not exercising often go hand in hand with poor dietary habits and so on. So how can we pin these correlations and associations on nutrition? Um, you can't prove by observing in any observational trial that it's really causal. 
And so some scientists say what we need are clinical trials, randomized clinical trials. The problem is that randomized clinical trials are terribly difficult. The exposures are diet that affects us in life. When I'm 50 now, it's going to affect me when I'm 70 years old. We can't do a 20 year old, 20 year long trial. It's very, very difficult. And our food, which is really what's important, the dietary patterns are very hard to quantify. They're very hard to prescribe. And ethically, you can't tell people, I'm going to randomize you to receive a healthy diet versus a standard American Western diet. And uh, I'm going to see what happens if you eat McDonald's versus what happens if you eat my health food uh, meal. And so the idea that we're going to get large randomized clinical trials to solve this problem is uh, really uh, uh, highly questionable. And so some people have said that the idea is infeasible and unlikely to advance nutritional scientists, not science or improve policies. Now, there is a convention called evidence-based medicine, which has the form of a pyramid. I don't know if we have any people from France who recognize this structure. The Louvre is closed these days, so it probably looks as beautiful and lonely as in this picture. But we use evidence from cell culture and animal models, cross-sectional and case control studies, perspective studies, and all of these are observational and placebo randomized control trials. And we try to say that as you go up the hierarchy, the validity, the strength of the evidence improves. And finally, you do something called a meta-analysis to look at the average effect across all these trials. And you try to see whether they're consistent or not and what size of the effect is, meaning how many people would be saved if you gave them and they complied with a given prescribed diet. And then uh, based on that, you can make, um, excuse me, you can make recommendations. And that has to achieve some kind of consensus. Now, this kind of very neat hierarchy doesn't really work very well, um, partly because you don't always need a clinical trial to prove something. Um, several years ago, in 2003, there was a, an editorial that tried to make this point by saying, you know, parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge, a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. Can we do a meta-analysis to prove that it's better to jump out of an airplane with a parachute than without a parachute? Now, you would think you don't need to do that trial, but according to the norm, you would say, well, yes, I mean, maybe better food and better diets are good for us, but we need to prove that definitively or we can't make any recommendations. Well, with regard to parachute use, someone actually did the trial. And uh, just last year, uh, the British Medical Journal published this randomized clinical trial, parachute use to prevent death and major trauma when jumping from aircraft. They did the RCT and lo and behold, they found that there was no benefit to jumping from an airplane with a parachute. Um, and people in the control group who jumped without, with a backpack did just as well. Um, of course, at the end of the study, when they described the methods and the interpretation, they showed that they jumped from a small airplane parked on the tarmac at an airport. Now, that's very amusing, but they were trying to make a serious point. And the serious point is that oftentimes we we'll do clinical trials in the wrong populations. We do them in the people who are at low risk. What you need to do is the trial in the populations who are at high risk. Let's think of this from an ethical perspective. Obviously, we wouldn't do a clinical trial in smoking anymore because we would say, well, if you smoke, you might get harm and we don't want to put you at harm. So it's not ethical to do a randomized clinical trial. And in fact, the tobacco companies use the lack of evidence, of definitive evidence for years to try to deflect the um, discussion about smoking and say, well, we can't be sure that it's smoking that causes disease. And in food companies, we have similar um, approaches to say, well, sugar is healthy. Everybody needs sugar. It's just a question of personal choice. Don't eat too much. Maybe there's an alternative to trying to say we need definitive clinical trials. Um, there's a way of grading the evidence and saying that it's plausible. It's likely that this approach would have a benefit the likelihood of the assessment that net benefit of a preventive service is correct. However, we would say as more information becomes available, the magnitude or direction of the effect, observed effect could change, and this change may be large enough to alter the conclusion. In other words, it's perfectly reasonable to give advice which is qualified. 
Um, and in fact, we do that. Um, we talk about optimal brain health in adults and the American Heart Association has a recommendation even though there isn't really a clinical trial that proves beyond doubt that you can defer or, or, or delay the risk of developing Alzheimer's. And they say you need a healthy diet consistent with current guidelines. The Alzheimer's Association says the same. So one could make guidelines to talk about health. And I think that we need to be able to do that without, even without randomized clinical trials, provided we qualify our recommendations. Because if we fail to give advice, then what you find is that there are all sorts of people who will um, take advantage of the uncertainty and of the regulatory scene, which allows you to sell um, supplements at will over the counter and make all sorts of claims which are legally permissible, but which ultimately have the caveat that this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and the product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent any disease. And there are harms when you believe that you can take a panacea, uh, particularly in the face of the kind of panic and, and concern and anxiety that we have over um, this particular epidemic. So my question it began uh, in my research career saying, well, you know, is there anything we can do to help prevent Alzheimer's disease? And if I can only understand the mechanism, I'll be able to develop a drug. Um, and I became more and more aware of the notion that really we need to look not only at individual supplements, and it's important to maintain our health through a healthful diet. But if we say that that's really important, and I want to give general advice like you saw for everyone to eat a healthful diet, what do we do about people who can't afford a healthful diet, who don't have the means to eat properly? And that led me to reformulate the question to ask, is a healthful diet really a lifestyle choice where we pin the moral responsibility, where we pin the onus on the individual? Remember, I started with the talk with, you know, what should I eat for myself? How do I keep myself away from the refrigerator? We think that our health and our dietary behaviors, since everyone eats and everything is voluntary, are really our personal responsibility. But sometimes it's a matter of life circumstances. On the left of my screen, you'll see people sitting out in the yard eating uh, a, a beautiful uh, meal. And on the right, you'll see elders who are come to a, a, a cafeteria where they can get um, a, a hot meal because they don't have money to uh, provide for themselves because it's hard to cook for themselves and because they need the social interaction and don't want to be socially isolated as we are today. It's not always clear that it's simply a matter of virtue. And so if we're going to have impact on the population's health, we need to take a population view. Food security is defined as when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Food insecurity is the absence of these conditions. So when we can't provide for ourselves what we need at all times, and we're not only talking about our physical health, food is essential to our well-being, then we wind up being insecure, and there are people who can't achieve this. The pillars have to do, when we analyze the causes, you can look at availability of the food. Is there food in the markets? Is there food on the farms? Does the country have a stockpile or a warehouse full of food in the case of an emergency to make sure that people can have food? Let's say there's an emergency and people are closed off at homes and if they really did shut us up in the house, we'd need to make sure we had access. So online deliveries might be a way, but my grocery deliveries online take two and a half weeks on the waiting list right now. What if I've run out of food in my fridge next week? We need to make sure that people have access. Now, usually we think of access in terms of ability to purchase food and to have a community and environment around us that has stores that provide it and distribute it properly. So those are very important in terms of the supply of food and the supply chain. Um, one can talk about utilizing food. How do I utilize the food? Am I able to eat the food and consume it? Am I able to distribute it in the family? And we often find that families that are food insecure reallocate food. So if you give the mother food because she's pregnant and you want to make sure that the fetus develops properly, but she is a mother of more than one child, then oftentimes the mother will give the food to the children at her, at her own 
peril and really at the harm of the developing fetus. So how we utilize food is very important in this construct. And of course, the stability of the food supply is important. We need to make sure that we can provide food and that our systems are resilient and um, can resist challenges to food supply. And in this case, we have a, a really very major challenge. In Israel specifically, <laughs> which is my arena, although the issue is not um, unusual, we have a paradox. We have want in the midst of plenty. We're the land of milk and honey. We have a tremendous agricultural wherewithal, high-tech agriculture, the likes of the world's envy. Um, we're also a startup nation, the Silicon Valley. We have a lot of money. In fact, that money and those reserves are going to help us see, see our society through this um, pandemic and the economic uh, uh, stuff. Um, economic uh, uh, downturn um, and hopefully will uh, will be successful in, in setting up policies that allow us to do that. But even before the pandemic, the issue has been that um, only 8% of our labor force is employed in high tech, but a fifth of the country, 20%, the lowest quintile of the country, live under the poverty line. Now it's relative poverty, it's not that they're living on subsisting of absolute poverty of less than $2 per day per capita, but it's really a problem. There are a lot of people in Israel who don't have food. Now, before this happened, um, if you look at the food supply in the world, this maps out in color how many kilocalories per capita there are per day, and most of the world have enough food. In yellow or orange, uh, light orange, you see countries where there's less, the food supply, the overall national food supply does not contain enough to provide uh, 2,500 uh, kilocalories per day, which one could say would be average for what uh, the daily requirements need to support um, health. Uh, but most of the food world lives in a surplus. And in Israel, certainly we have a surplus. Um, just fruits and vegetables, we have half a kilo of them per day, per capita. Um, if you look at uh, fat and protein, we have uh, uh, plenty of, uh, of fat, plenty of protein, and the total energy in our, in, in our food supply is enough to provide um, nearly twice, or one and a half times what people need per day. Um, so there shouldn't be any problem, in theory, providing everyone with food. Having said that, when you measure food insecurity in Israel, and this is again before the pandemic, we're talking about 20% of the population right here on the right where it says total. These are government data saying 18.9% of the population are food insecure. These data are from 2014, they've gone down by a bit of a percent point, uh, but they tend to be very, very stable and we haven't made a dent in this. What's really interesting is that if you look at the risk factors for food insecurity, and this is relevant to what we're talking about now, not having a breadwinner, in other words, having a single income, being unemployed, um, you go from 27.6% uh, of those population, of those households are food insecure, uh, to 41% with no breadwinners. Um, and if you're on welfare, then half of the people on welfare are food insecure as well. Now, the downturn has caused nearly a million Israelis, or maybe more than a million Israelis, to be unemployed. And that puts everyone at risk. That's an enormous problem. We know that people who are food insecure, if you look at the expenditure on food, according to the quintile of income in the Israeli population, you see that the bottom quintile consumes far fewer fruits and vegetables and um, dairy, eggs, meat, poultry, highly nutritious, energy, um, uh, energy dense, but also nutrient dense foods. Um, are not purchased as much as in the upper quintiles. And instead, people buy empty calories. They buy um, starch and oil and sugar um, that supply their, fill their stomachs, but not uh, uh, their nutritional needs. So food insecurity in Israel is due to lack of access and not availability. And that's fundamentally a problem of social and economic um, policies and an issue of poverty. So one of the ways in which societies have dealt with that is to say, okay, we're going to go to the third sector. We're going to go to food banks, to philanthropy. We don't want to see people suffer 
and lack among us. Food is such a basic need that people can't turn away when people are hungry, and rightly so. And if you look at our food supply, an enormous amount of food is thrown away. This is all of these uh, data that I'm giving you are true of the Western world. They're true in the UK, they're true in Europe, they're true in the United States. It's not a matter of um, uh, simply a problem that's unique to Israel. Um, the prevalence rates may change slightly, but these are overall patterns that have to do with how we understand our food system. Um, in Israel specifically, we're looking at about 2.3 million tons that are wasted um, and of those, about 1 million tons could be rescued and redistributed. And in fact, the United Nations and, and the food science community around the world looks at the, at the um, uh, ways to study and understand how we can reduce um, food waste and uh, do a better job of both at the, at a household level, but certainly at a national level, of not letting food go to waste. And that food that's still in good shape um, that otherwise would be thrown away. For example, expired uh, yogurt on the shelves of our supermarkets. It isn't really um, uh, necessarily spoiled. It's simply that we have a very conservative safety criteria not to market it after that. So we throw it away if it isn't purchased, if it isn't bought. Uh, could that be redistributed to people safely and ethically? Would someone who needs food want to receive that food? There are a lot of questions around this, but there's certainly a lot to do, and there are food banks that deal with them. In my lab, we've studied how food aid quality, what you put into the food basket. We've looked specifically at a food bank that deals with um, rescuing agricultural surplus and agricultural waste for free. They've got a logistics center, and they distribute it to over 200,000 people every day. It's an enormous operation. And there have been questions over whether or not this investment makes any sense. Are we really having an impact on people's health? Because the food baskets ultimately can only provide a small proportion of the family's total food income. It helps them save at the supermarket. They don't have to buy everything, but it isn't all that they eat. And so you might think that it really proportionally doesn't do a great deal of good. And so we categorized, we looked at their, the, the, quality of the food in the basket and the proportion of fruits and vegetables. And then we looked at what people were eating overall or reported that they were eating. And it was interesting that even if you put a little bit of fruits and vegetables in their baskets, that has an impact on the, their, their eating habits, on their tendency to eat fruits and vegetables. Or so we interpret the data. And it improves their diet measurably. But when you look at what's in the basket, and I've got about 10, well, I'm, I'm running a little bit slow, but I, I have a few more minutes to make the point and get back to the pandemic. If you look what's in their baskets, um, vitamin D is um, uh, very low. Uh, you can see in orange, orange are the proportion of the people who don't meet the RDA for these various nutrients. So 100% of our recipients in our study did not reach the RDA of vitamin D. Um, overall, on average, the mean intake of the cohort of the population that we study, they only took in about a fifth of the amount of vitamin D that they needed. And this was true of many of the nutrients that we saw. Um, and so if you look even at total healthy portions, just a general gestalt of that dietary pattern that we would recommend, and that we tell as policy, as government policy, eat healthy food. Um, 93% of them did not meet the recommended number of healthy portions, and the average intake of healthy portions was only 60% of what we recommend. That reflects the economic data I showed you earlier. And the result of this is that in food insecure populations, we have, and we've measured this in Israel, we have roughly four times the risk of chronic disease, of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer than we do in the general population. And again, these are not data that are unique to Israel. This is true throughout the Western world. And yet, should we be relying on food banks, on philanthropy, in order to provide the needs of our society? Where are our governments? Where is welfare? How, obviously, from a, a moral, ethical point of view, yes, charity is crucial. In Passover, we say, halach the bread of affliction at our Seder tables, let all who are in need come and eat. And we open our doors to invite them in. And we give charity, we give tzedakah in order to make sure that people can have meal on their, uh, food on their tables 
during this holiday season, but it's, it's a general message for how we should be overall. And it's not only Jews on Ramadan, there is a zakat which gives charity. And, and in any culture, in any religion, this is fundamentally important. So morally, we all say, well, food banks are great. But in fact, if you look at the food bank system in Israel, just the three major food banks who are, have been called upon by the government in this pilot plan um, for our, our, our national policy for food security, they said, well, we don't want to create a new bureaucracy to distribute food and we don't have the means, so let's use the charities to distribute food to people who, who need. And the government has donated maybe 50 million shekel to this, but the overall um, operating budget of just three largest food banks in Israel is somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 million shekel. In other words, the government can say, oh, really, it's a question of charity. And when I talked about this problem last night, we had a webinar at the faculty um, with one of our colleagues in the economics department who's advising the economic pandemic response for the government. I said, well, what are you doing to support the issue of food security? Do you have any projection of how many more people are going to need food? Um, there was no answer, there was no number. I said, well, what are you doing to support this uh, safety net? And the answer was, well, we're giving 200 million shekel budgeted out of our um, 80 billion shekel budget to stimulate and support the economy and businesses, um, we're only going to put 200 million shekel into supporting the food banks. And really that's the way of channeling government money to people. Um, but in fact, we're relying on donations to support our population. And I'm, I'm not sure that's the best mean. What's interesting here in this debate, and you can argue about it from a, a data-driven perspective and from an ethical perspective and from a policy efficacy perspective, there's a stress test. And the stress test is in an emergency, we no longer have the food supply to the food banks because the fields can't be picked because the hospital, the hotels, the institutional food providers who give their surplus meals um, aren't operating because there are no volunteers to run the uh, food banks um, because people are isolated at home. Um, there's no way to distribute it to the people who are at home. In fact, this whole system, and, and should I add the donors who provide philanthropy have seen their resources um, crash with the stock market. So if we build, a, as a matter of policy, as a matter of social structure and social planning, if we build a reliance on emergency food banks, which are really supposed to help people only in acute need, but have become chronic crutches. The crutches may be kicked out from under us in the case of a real emergency. And we're seeing this crisis all around the world. In fact, if you look New York Times, Washington Post, Daily Mail, um, it's very scary. UK food banks close as coronavirus stalls donation. This is a very serious issue. I don't have solutions for it yet, except to say that we should be smarter about how we provide our net for providing food security in these types of epidemics. One could have a war, not only an epidemic, uh, uh, to cut out um, the food supply, or one could have a Brexit, which changes the way in which we trade across, uh, across markets. Um, there are all sorts of issues which affect our, our food supply and its stability. Prices can go up rendering people more and more vulnerable. All of these issues need a policy response which is more comprehensive than relying on the goodwill of charities. But I told you in the charity, and I'll, I'll wrap up in, in just two minutes, the issue of vitamin D is important. Um, it's important because it actually has, there's some good evidence from that analysis and clinical trials that it may be relevant for our immune function. I'm concerned my day to day with how we make sure that the population nutrition is adequate in order to achieve maximal or optimal health across society. Personally, my narrow perspective is optimal brain development and brain health and, and well-being. But it's true for all diseases, what's good for the heart and good for the brain and good for our, our general uh, well-being um, are, are pretty much the same. There isn't a magic vitamin for brain and vitamin for heart, and vitamin for eyes, um, although there may be specific connections. And um, I had taught epidemiology, as I told you, and we finished the semester. And um, some of my students uh, were really eager to continue to learn. They were interested in, in being challenged not to look at their profession, their chosen profession, as 
treating individual patients, but really saying, oh, we can have an impact that's broader. We can deal with people in society. Could you help us learn more about this? And we said, okay, sure, we'll set up a, a new uh, kind of uh, uh, epidemiology or public health club across the faculty. We have colleagues in animal health. Uh, our dean, Benny Hefetz, deals with um, uh, environmental uh, contaminants in the water supply that get into our bodies through agriculture. So he takes a population perspective as well. But let's get all these people together. It's true that we're not at the medical school and the School of Public Health, but let's sit down and see if we can have beer and pizza once a month. Students will drive a journal club and we'll, we'll sit down and talk. Well, lo and behold, we didn't open the second semester. We were all relegated to our homes. And instead the students said, listen, we wanna do a literature survey. We wanna look at what the literature says about nutrition in relation to at least respiratory infections, acute respiratory infections, even if there isn't anything about this new virus. And they came up with a very interesting paper about vitamin D. Liab um, Alofer uh, or it should be or Avishai, David Bahal, Ron Sternfeld, Omer Kramer, they're second year students in the middle of all the pressure of their courses, in the middle of this pandemic, which has appended everything they were supposed to do. They're all learning from home. And yet they said, we want to make a difference. And I said, sure, I'm gonna help you. You do the reading, come back to me. We'll hold a discussion and see what we come up with. I'll summarize it here. Um, was a meta-analysis, a study that looks at 25 clinical trials that have been conducted in 15 countries around the world and over 10,000 people, looking at whether giving people vitamins, vitamin D in various regimes, reduces the risk of infection. And this is important because vitamin D deficiency is a pandemic. You can see down here on the bottom of the slide, um, there's a paper that came out several years by Michael Hollick saying, listen, you know, a billion people around the world are deficient in vitamin D. Now we all know this is important for our bone health and osteoporosis prevention, but in fact, it's related to diabetes and it has non-bone functions, including modulating the immune system. And the meta-analysis took these 25 trials, some of which had positive results and some of which were null, some of which didn't show any benefit. And each one was in old people, young people, different parts of the world, different diets, different exposure to sunlight, because most of our vitamin D comes normally from exposure to sun, except we wear clothes and work in offices. And even in sunny Israel, 70% of the population are deficient in vitamin D. And we've been trying from the Faculty of Agriculture and other colleagues to get the government to add vitamin D on a required mandatory basis to our milk um, in order to make sure that we improve the vitamin D status across the population. And it's the elderly population who are at most at risk because even if they go out into the sun for sufficient number of hours a day, um, and, and of course there's a concern of, of skin cancer as well, that you want to avoid the same ultraviolet light that stimulates vitamin D synthesis also damages DNA and causes cancer. So you can't be out too much. But a, a young person who goes out into the sun for, and has a, a Caucasian with bright skin will make about 20,000 IUs of vitamin D in 20 minutes. An older individual, a 70 year old, may make on average 2,000 IUs. So there's a decline with age and obviously with mobility, people who are homebound don't get out into the sun and that these days includes all of us. What they found in the meta-analysis was that in fact, if you take the average of all these participants, then there was a 12% reduction in risk in the treatment group, that is those who are supplemented with vitamin D, 12% reduction in getting uh, an infection compared to the uh, control group. But if you stratified the population, you only looked at people who had low levels in their blood to start with, then there was a 70% reduction, um, an odds ratio of 0.3. So vitamin D supplementation was very protective, but bolus dosing of vitamin D was ineffective. So taking a lot is not good for you, doesn't have any benefit. In fact, it may carry some risks. Although the amount you need to take to really have risk, the tolerable upper limit is 4,000 IUs per day. And most of the trials that used a daily dose of about 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day um, showed this benefit, particularly among people who are deficient. Now, does that mean we should now go to patients and measure the vitamin D as they're being intubated? And the answer is, well, it would be really interesting to know and it would be really interesting to do a randomized controlled trial, but I don't think it's feasible. I don't think it's safe. And I, I'm not even sure it's ethical. 
um, if you give this low amount on a daily basis and it is unlikely to cause harm, it is unlikely to cause worsening of the symptoms. Now, we don't know that for sure, so a trial would be ideal. But if we're concerned with the general population and with flattening that curve, and we expect that 60 to 70 percent of the population will eventually become infected, even if we flatten the curve and it's drawn out until we have a vaccine or we develop herd immunity, then in fact it would make sense to try to protect as many people as possible by recommending supplementation across the population. And we wrote a position paper um, that was uh, just discussed this morning by uh, the pandemic response team in the Ministry of Health in Israel. And they uh, decided that they wouldn't recommend uh, uh, supplementation across the board as a, as a mandatory requirement, um, but they would issue a recommendation that said that we need to have a healthy diet. But within that diet, consider taking vitamin D supplements um, if at least if you're at risk population, um, the known risks for the disease and the known risks for deficiency. Um, it's not quite what we were aiming for, but that's where the ethical debate over do we need the clinical trial or do we need to make the best recommendation we can on the best possible evidence um, is still up in the air. And during this pandemic, I think we have to challenge some of our assumptions. This is not business as usual. And yet, we don't want to throw away the baby into the bathwater and, and, and give up on all our, our stringencies. And so this uh, debate will continue. And I'm very proud and pleased uh, with my students and the nutrition school that's been able to try to advance this. Um, we submitted uh, a paper to a, a leading uh, clinical journal um, asking them to raise this issue in the scientific uh, discourse. And I, I hope we'll hear back a positive reply in a few days. If not, we'll resubmit it, uh, but we'll begin to uh, publicize these results. So if you want to take home message before I wrap up, before I finish, um, I think it makes sense for people generally at this point in time to be taking 1,000 to 2,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. Um, I wouldn't do it on a chronic basis after the pandemic. When the pandemic ends, um, make sure your blood levels are, are, are tested by your um, clinician and then um, uh, see if there's need to continue taking it uh, uh, from there on. Um, it seems to me prudent. Um, overdosing with vitamin D can have complications such as kidney stones in the long run. But in the short term, I think that we need to uh, be considering this. Um, so with that, I will wrap up. Um, one last word. If you find someone who says a nutritional cure for the disease, or if you take these mega doses, or if you buy my formulation, um, you will be protected. You will not get infected. Don't believe it. Any hyperbole is not going to be true. Um, and so stay away from uh, false, uh, false claims and false promises and look at the science. Um, well, there are other uh, concerns like uh, climate change and, uh, and other concerns of society. It's amazing what will happen when there's an emergency that focuses the mind and uh, our concentration. Um, with that, I'll end. And thank you for joining us here today. Thank you very much. And so we are now open for questions and answer session. So we have first question from Julian. Julian, you can talk. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. I'd be happy to see your video if you want to uh, show your face, <laughs> if you can. Uh, I will try. Uh, I, don't know. I don't think that in the webinars. In the we webinar, can. they can. No, no, okay. No. It, I think it's not a law because they have some like privacy issues and. and okay. Sure. And um, my, my question is two. Uh, I saw recently like the supermarket they're rising the the price of the vegetables and mm -hmm. probably because the coronavirus uh, situation and you you say this a lot of in, in like wasted or unique resources in from from farmers what do you think 
we can make available the resources to the people and not waste them. What, what this is one question. Another question is, I don't know if you are not a virologist, but maybe you have some insight about this. Uh, I read, I, I read uh, last week a paper or uh, well, pre, a preprint about the the cats. Uh, the coronavirus. The cats can 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 be contagious by coronavirus, and I want you to be safe about the cats, about because in if in Israel streets are plenty of cats and I know these cats have a, 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 I don't know this is a excretions and and what's like in the lips in things in surface so I want to be like uh, understand a little bit about the safety about the what happened the cats and coronavirus that's my two questions okay well for the first question if I understood correctly um, you know, how can we deal with the issue of food on the farm and, and making sure that there's an adequate supply of uh, fruits and vegetables um, so that prices don't go up? So it, it's really, uh, that has to do with complex agricultural economics. Um, and I'm not an expert to uh, uh, give you a, a full solution, um, but I can I make some observations. One is uh, from our experience here in Israel, the farmers who are um, not able to bring their produce to market have now resorted, there, there's been a, uh, a movement to deliver directly to the customer. People are doing online delivery. People, the, the population are recommended to stay or required to stay at home, except for shopping. Um, the supermarkets have expensive produce. Uh, if we're seeing the price rise, it's simply an issue of supply and demand. So the yeah. simple economists would say, well, in a free market, supply and demand control the prices. It would be a question under an emergency, do you want to intervene in the, in the market in that way? And, and that's, that's a bit beyond me, although policies I'll touch on are very important for that. But what the, the farmers have done is to say, okay, well, my fields are going to waste. I'm going to ship um, my produce directly to you because that's still allowed. Um, and I'll do it at a, at a very basic price. Um, so I could buy a, a whole crate of artichokes for, uh, for, for a few dollars. Um, and some of this marketing has been done on social media. So I get Facebook posts and WhatsApp posts about farmers in my region. Um, my sister sent me, oh, uh, you know, there's a farm next door to where you live that has something, you know, maybe you can go and get it. For eggs, which we ran out of, I um, got up at six o'clock in the morning and uh, stood outside the uh, uh, distributor's uh, warehouse at the, at the egg packing facility. And I wasn't alone. There was a long line of cars and they set up a drive through so that you could drive through without touching or talking to people. You rolled down your window, they gave you your egg, you gave them your credit card and, and drove out. Um, who would have thought that the goose was laying golden eggs these days? Uh, so they're, they're doing a good business. Um, but most of us don't have enough uh, uh, to put in our in our pantry, which is odd. And maybe because we're we're hoarding, there isn't enough to distribute evenly to go around. Um, some of these initiatives are are larger, so there are farmers who are getting together in collectives to offer a whole shopping list, and that's just within the space of a few short weeks. There are um, the high tech response in Israel is you have an app for it, so you can download apps and fill in your shopping list, and people will deliver. So supply and demand is one issue. How you organize in communities, it's fascinating to see. I wish we could collect the data and understand it so that we can map this out and both share it now to people around the world and then figure out uh, how this tells us how we may do business better in the future. But there's also a big policy issue, which has uh, uh, troubled Israel for a long time. And I think it's probably relevant in other countries as well. Do we import food in order to lower prices and compete with our local producers who tend to be expensive? Or do we support our food security by making sure that our local food growers and our local food industry is protected against imports? And if you're a consumer and you don't have a lot of money, and I've just talked about food security and poverty, you say, no, I want my fruits and vegetables dirt cheap. But if you're looking at this from the perspective of food security in the terms of making sure that we always grow enough food to feed ourselves, you can crush the farmers. You can shut down all the farms in Israel and grow. I, I think you're familiar with us if you know our cats. 
So you know that most of the cats are urban and most of Israel is urban and uh, you know, do away with the farms and, and uh, build uh, uh, real estate, lower the prices of housing. That would help people too. And import our food, cucumbers and tomatoes from Turkey. But finding the balance between one need and another, finding a balance between the values of a, of a free society, a free market society and, and the uh, considerations of controlling the prices and access and availability for food are major issues in food politics everywhere. And we have a particularly uh, uh, fraught um, tension between, in a very small centralized food system, between the few people who control the supermarkets and, um, and uh, the grocers, um, and they control the supply chain, and the farmers, on the other hand, who uh, uh, struggle to make a living. So it's, it's a big issue, and I, I don't have perfect answers. As for the cats, my, yes. my colleague, uh, what happens when you have a pandemic, and one of the reasons this is so frightening, it's a new pathogen that hasn't spread around the world. Human beings have taken it from an animal in China and spread it everywhere, and now we may spread it back into the animals in our environment. The animals and the humans can become a reservoir. The pathogen lives or finds itself within the population in the reservoir. And you can think of uh, malaria and mosquitoes that carry the the parasite um, and move it from person to person. So there's an interaction between people and their environment. And one of the things that we try to understand at the Faculty of Agriculture, Food and Environment is this one health concept, the concept that our health is intimately connected to the health of the environment and the health of the animals that we live with in a, in a system, in an ecosystem. Uh, my colleague, Eyal Clement at the Veterinary School um, is a specialist, he's an epidemiologist who studies cats and cats populations in Israel. I don't have the answer, but it's a wonderful question. I will relay it to him and I can bet you that there's going to be a grant that I'm sure will be funded to try to track coronavirus in the cat population because I, I think that's something we should pay attention to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Okay. We have now a question in the chat from Raman Schlemmer. And uh, asking if there is a particular form you recommend to take daily with vitamin D, like oil. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't have a particular recommendation. Um, my students are looking into it as we speak. Tomorrow morning, I'll have a better answer. To my particular vitamin metabolic pathways, folate, B12, and uh, B6. Um, so I'm not a vitamin D expert. But we did consult on this with uh, uh, world experts uh, abroad and with uh, Sofia Isha Shalom at uh, the Technion um, and uh, Technion's medical school. Um, and they did not remark on which form of vitamin D, uh, but they did endorse these recommendations. Um, so I, I can find out and pass it through Mara if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll find out tomorrow and let you know. But I think, I think anything that you find, the vitamin D, whether it's D2 or D3, should be adequate in the uh, form that you get. Okay, we have now Sylvia. Sylvia, you can speak. Sylvia Mishani. She's muted. Can you unmute her? Yeah, I unmuted her too. Now, now is better? Yes, I hear you, Sylvia. Okay. I would like to know your opinion about a vegan nutrition, people who only eat um, vegetables and this kind of food, not in relation to the pandemic, but in normal or regular life. Well, um, people who eat uh, vegan nutrition generally, uh, some are nice and some aren't. My, my brother-in-law is lovely, and he's a, an environmental ethicist who's a vegan, um, and he lives very well. So in terms of health, um, to answer your question seriously, there isn't evidence that vegan nutrition in and of itself um, is uh, any way inferior to um, omnivorous nutrition. Having said that, there are certain kinds of nutrients and certain kind of conditions where it is easier to achieve um, a, a dense nutrient intake 
um, efficiently and, and that's bioavailable, that the body can assimilate and consume from uh, animal uh, sources. Um, so I'm not, leaving aside the ethical issue, I'm not convinced that uh, animal foods are not healthful, but again, one has to take them in, in uh, moderation. And the general issue of environmental uh, uh, sustainability and climate sustainability drives us to looking for alternatives to animal produce. Um, we simply can't consume it as much as we do uh, and have the um, uh, uh, world survive um, or, or remain the same the way we like it today. Um, what one has to pay attention to as a vegan uh, is first to make sure that one eats balanced uh, nutrition uh, in, in terms of energy intake and expenditure. You could be a vegan and eat potatoes and uh, and fries all day and uh, have very poor diet. Um, and there are certain nutrients which are hard to obtain from a vegan diet. Vitamin B12, my expertise is one of them. Um, B12 is uh, typically found in animal um, sources, animal source food, and it's very hard to have enough without um, supplementation. So vegans should have good nutritional education from a reliable source, not from a fad, um, a guru, but really make sure that they learn their nutrition properly, that they supplement the nutrients that are needed that can't be obtained readily from their diet, um, if only as an insurance. And if you do that, um, then the studies that I have seen would indicate that there are not uh, uh, harms for that type of diet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have um, time for one more question. I can go on all night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. at home. So for a few more questions, but I don't see any other uh, raised hand. Here we have James Otieno. James? James? Yeah. Yeah, you can ask your, your question. Uh, based on these micronutrients that you're having around, uh, which, which, which micronutrient will you like uh, advocate for that people should eat uh, to help prevent, uh, prevent this COVID-19? Because it's like, uh, it's a disease or the virus is uh, Majorly affecting the immune system or those who are having chronic diseases. So, as I said, I think the recommendation to have a healthy, balanced diet is, is a sound one. One needs a healthy, balanced diet. There is no specific nutrient for the immune system. It isn't that if you take something, you can. You have to be clear this isn't going to, any nutrient will not prevent infection. And it will not boost the immune system, somehow take the immune system and rev it up, make it work better um, than it would normally if you were in optimal nutrition, optimal health. So the problem is making sure that there are no deficiency states. And if we look at populations, at the diet of populations, not at the individual level, but if you look at the diet of populations, there are a lot of nutrients which are lacking some of which are known to modify, modulate the immune system. So there's vitamin A, there's vitamin C, there's zinc, which are, are typically um, discussed um, in, in this context. Um, some of them, if you supplement and take too many, vitamin A can be toxic at high doses. And in fact, one of the reasons for worrying about clinical trials, vitamin A is, is in the class of uh, uh, compounds called carotenoids. And people thought, well, carotenoids are antioxidants, they also signal in, in the cells and regulate gene expression, but they're antioxidants. So we'll just give people beta carotene and they'll be better. And they, they did a study looking at lung cancer. And it turned out that smokers who took beta carotene did worse and wound up having higher rates of lung cancer. And it didn't protect them at all. In fact, it made them sicker. So one has to be cautious with taking supplements um, indiscriminately. The ones which are being discussed, which I found in the literature these days, um, with respect to coronavirus, in fact, there was a paper that came out of China um, saying we want to look at vitamin, everyone should be assessed for vitamin C, vitamin D, 
and zinc, um, as well as uh, uh, various B vitamins, and then treat it accordingly. Um, mind you that in China, the uh, uh, cultural approaches to complementary medicine and to preventive medicine are different than they are in other um, uh, cultures and, and establishments. So that's kind of a long way of saying, I don't have any particular uh, nutrient. Um, I think a multivitamin is probably sound. They're safe under normal conditions. They may provide um, some insurance uh, under uh, uh, these conditions. They're not going to prevent infection, but they will help ensure that your nutritional status is up to par if you're not eating habitually, eating a healthy diet. Vitamin D is of particular concern because if you look at a standard multivitamin, uh, Centrum is the uh, most popular brand in, in many places in the world. Um, they have 125 international units of vitamin D. The data from the clinical trial um, was 1,000 to 2,000. From the meta-analysis of multiple clinical trials said a dose of 1,000 to 2,000 would be relevant in this context. So in the context of trying to avoid respiratory infections, and there have been no clinical trials on COVID yet, of course, because it's new, then the logic would say that we have moderately good evidence from randomized clinical trials to recommend something specifically for vitamin D. I haven't been convinced from what I've seen in the other nutrients that um, we, we have that quality of evidence. But the general idea to make sure that you're getting adequate intake, if you're not sure about diet, if the supply chain has been disrupted and it's hard to get fruits and vegetables from your grocer, then the multivitamin seems to me a reasonable approach at this time. Um, if you lived in a society like the United States where two thirds of the population consume multivitamins anyway, and you do a trial or you do an observational study, you're gonna find that the multivitamins have no added benefit. So if you have a healthy diet, you don't need the multivitamins, but um, it's hard to know that. And so that's where there's some, uh, uh, we don't have the trials and we don't have the clarity to say, what should you, um, James, be taking? Um, because I don't know you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think then you've got to do your own assessment. You can ask a nutritionist or your doctor and you can uh, take a multivitamin just as insurance. Uh, but really focus on quality of diet and the recommendation for vitamin D at this point in time is the one that I think is uh, the most um, uh, a reasonable supplement. So currently a good uh, balanced diet is like the ideal? Always. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we now have our last question to Herbert here. Herbert? Uh, hello. Uh, I'm sorry I came in so late. And uh, Professor Trone, we certainly enjoyed when you visited us at Temple Isaiah and spoke ah. to the Israel and World Jewelry Committee. Mm -hmm. question I remember that well. Thank you. I have your, your certificate up on my wall in my office. Well, we're delighted to hear that. <laughs> I was wondering, unfortunately, I was not able to be involved in the entire webinar, and will any of it be available, especially the written material, afterwards? Um, <clears throat> you, you are going to receive the recording afterwards, tomorrow. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think what I would say as a science educator, mm -hmm. there is a great need in the United States for greater public understanding of what vitamins are. Mm -hmm. There is little understanding that vitamins can only be a supplement to diet. Some people think if they take multivitamins, they can eat anything and it doesn't make any difference. And I think it is very important that we find ways to get people to understand the greater importance of diet compared to supplemental vitamins. 
Um, generally, I would agree with you, Herbert. 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 I think if you take the policy perspective, then knowledge and education are vital. Um, they're not enough because often we know things, um, but we don't act on them. I know that I shouldn't hang out at my refrigerator when I'm stuck at home um, <laughs> or when I'm stressed, and yet even I do it. So knowledge is not sufficient and it's also not sufficient because we have many different um, goals in life, not all of which are health. Um, if, I, if I only attended to my health, I wouldn't be working around the clock these days. Um, but, but we have priorities and they're competing and they aren't all reconcilable. So education is crucial, I agree with you entirely. And that helps people um, question, not, not only know what is good for their health, but understand how they choose to balance that in terms of their values. And more importantly, I think, um, how they choose to structure our social, our communities and our, our laws and our institutions to promote those things that we value um, and to oppose interests which we may find to be problematic, um, such as some of the uh, health and wellness industry. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you to everybody. Um, it was a great pleasure, Professor Troen. Thank you to all. I wish you all of you Chag Sameach and Pesach Sameach and um, hope to see you uh, after Pesach uh, uh, for the next webinars. You can uh, write to me your questions if you have more and I will forward to Professor Troen. I'm sure he will be happy to answer you. I'd be delighted and I'd like to wish everyone, first of all, thank you for joining us here. Um, I wish I could have seen uh, my audience, but I, I imagine you all um, uh, as, as wonderful friends. And um, I hope we'll have the opportunity to meet in person. Please uh, accept my wishing, wishes for a, a very happy holiday. And um, may we all be so fortunate as to be able to celebrate with ample food um, and make sure that those in our communities also uh, have that opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot.